Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Ron Hawkins, a musician and occasional soundtrack composer who's best known as the frontman of the awesome Toronto band The Lowest of the Low, and they're celebrating the release of their new album, Do the Right Now, with a concert at the Danforth Music Hall this Friday, September 9th. So, you know, perfect excuse to have him on the show. And Ron came loaded for Bear. He chose The Third Man, Carol Reed's 1949 masterpiece, starring Joseph Cotton as a naive American who travels to Vienna after World War II to investigate the death of a friend and discovers one horrible truth after another about his bosom pal Harry Lyme. Lyme is played by Orson Welles, as you may have heard. Written by the novelist Graham Greene as a study of global politics, human frailty, and the opportunistic depravity that results when you put those things together, it's, well, it's one of the greatest films ever made about anything. I'm not even going to tell you anything else about it, because, you know, what's the point? If you don't know, well, go watch The Third Man, and then come back. This is someone else's movie. I hadn't watched it in probably a decade and a half or something, but I remember being kind of obsessed with it when I, for the first time I saw it. Mm -hmm. Just the pacing of it and the style. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things, it's funny, because it's one of the things that's coming back around to me uh with the Trump election and stuff like that, there's things like this, like the immediate post-war division of Europe and, and you know, the, the thin skin of, of uh, civility that we live under most of the time that is easily eroded the minute there's any challenge to anybody's actual livelihood or... Yeah. yeah. So that, that sort of... I mean, and maybe that's why it subconsciously jumped into my mind from, from the back. But uh, and also on a musical level, there's a song by a guy named Phil Oaks uh, called "Love Me, I'm a Liberal," which, mm -hmm. which I've been referencing a lot lately as well because I feel like we're in a place where, uh, not unlike World War II, or you know, uh, there's some real hard looks that people need to take at the assumptions they make about liberality and if that's a word, liberality, their liberalness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, philanthropy. Uh, just you know, just the way people interact with people. Yeah, the concept of doing good in the world, maybe, because that runs through the film. Yeah, quite a bit. And just and there's that that great line. There's a great line in there about, uh, you know, they have their five year plan and they think of the proletariat and you know, and, and I think of mugs and you know, uh, and he's got his five year plan. And he's like, how different is it really that you know I don't have a state stamp of approval on my terrorism or on my machinations they do yeah. but it's no different really when you think about it yeah it's it struck me on this latest viewing that that harry lime is exactly who he says he is he's yeah. like the whole story of this film is about the disillusionment of hollis martin uh who is the white-eyed american who comes to vienna to find the corpse presumably like he's going to investigate the death of his friend mm -hmm. and he writes cowboy novelettes i think he calls them and they're just yeah, Zane, Zane Grey esque. Yeah, they're they're perceived as we never get to read them, but they're disposable yeah, pulp chapter fiction. fiction, right? And he spends the entire movie arguing that this man, who he barely knows if at all, uh, really, is a good person, and he's been misunderstood. And yeah. the more we learn, the more we hear throughout the film, even before Wells shows up as Harry Lyme, this character, this this embodiment of of opportunism and cynicism, you can't. You just you you spend all this time watching Holly make this protest. No, he was a good guy. I know him, and I keep thinking now of every single story that breaks in the media about someone doing something awful. And the first thing you hear is, "Oh no, he can't be not, he can't be that person." I know that guy. He's nice, mm -hmm. and it's just like we've learned nothing. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's sixty, seventy years on, and we have learned nothing about putting evidence in front of emotion or being responsible to the people around like the concept of the victim of the, this person is and, and you know hashtag believe women and all those things that have happened now that aren't catching that aren't working mm -hmm. because human bias will always be in favor of the people we know rather than the horrifically victimized people that we don't you're right and it's america in europe and it's everything it's it was relevant then it's relevant now and it just I just watched it this time and thought, oh, Christ, I really 
did I not notice that before? Or was it just me ignoring it because I was enjoying the ride too much? Because it yeah. is a wonderful film. Yeah, and it's and it comes around like as you say, like Holly Martin's going there uh, with this sort of wide-eyed, as you say, he represents sort of the good-natured liberal American. Yeah, Marshall Plan guys going in, yeah, fixing stuff, and and you know, and there you go. So you can look at the Marshall Plan. You can look at going and doing the job of obviously getting rid of Hitler being an important job to do, and mm-hmm. everybody needed to do it. But once that job is done, and even it could be considered part of maybe the bonus of going to do that job was everybody already dividing up the spoils of what was going to happen afterward. Right. And so it's this real thin line of uh, philanthropy and payback. And I think for Holly Martins, it's the same thing. He goes there thinking he's going to see the best of the best, you know, almost like probably the people he would write about in his novels, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. He's going to see the the un, the un white hats, you know, sort of... Yeah, the real heroes of putting, reconstruction. Putting Europe right? back together, putting Vienna back together after this horrible experience. And what he sees is a bunch of people having this internecine war for their own interests. And then, as Harry Lyme points out later, he's just a civilian doing the same thing. Of course, he's doing something absolutely horrible, which is he's, what, he's watering down uh, penicillin. Yeah, he's, he's... And people are dying he's because killing he's... children, effectively. He's, yeah. Because he's skimming. Yeah. It's reverse skimming. He's adding instead of taking away, but it's, it yeah. ultimately takes things away. Yeah, no, he's a war profiteer, no question. Yeah. Like, he's not a good person, but he is suave and disconnected from it and there's no blood on his hands and why would you believe them when your friend tells you I'm just you know making a buck it's no big deal I mean that's that was the second Bush administration Mm -hmm. probably some people in the Obama administration I mean it's it's endemic it happens every time and it's absolutely the Trump administration well and I would even suggest that uh, you know as much nicer as it looks we get to be very patronizing in Canada but I mean when when you look at uh, the Canada Day the the 150 celebrations and I I certainly may have put some zeros on this and I'm hoping that I did but uh, I heard what I thought was 500 million dollars but maybe it was 50 million dollars regardless of how many millions of dollars were spent on these celebrations Mm -hmm. you know then you've got First Nations people going here's an idea yeah yeah how about no millions dollars and you take that 50 million dollars and do what you said you were going to do to get elected and you know we really talk about What's going yeah, on? Reconstruction, you know? restitution, and the, hell, let's look into missing and murdered indigenous women a little harder. It's it's yeah, fifty million dollars would go a long way to help that. Yeah, and it's five you know, million would. Like that's that's yeah. I guess that's the thing that bothers me too is that you could fifty. You could let's start with both. fifty dollars. You can actually do both if you really commit as a mm-hmm. government, and somehow someone has decided. You're absolutely right that the 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 optics of one are better than actual activity on the other. And yeah, yeah you're right. I. I and it frustrates, Trudeau too, frustrates, frustrates me because but. because I think people can see it and and it's like you know I just I feel like people walk around realizing these things you know and I like I've railed against I'm I'm not railing against philanthropy because obviously philanthropy is important and if people have money or, you know and they're spending it to help people that's better than not doing it but to me just like this situation with uh, with the Canada 150 it's like you know wouldn't it be more helpful and more equitable to start off with a certain game plan you know this is this is the basis of what our society needs to function and uh, let's take care of that before we start celebrating how great we are you know plus there's stuff we're celebrating that doesn't really deserve celebration that's the other yeah i was saying to people like happy 150 years of colonialism yeah exactly and that's a real downer for a lot of people who are wearing canadian flag sweatshirts yeah well and people who get angry when you mention it too that I, that i really i mean i get it they want to have fun and they don't want to think about this stuff yes. just like people who buy tube socks like the stephen colbert line about buying tube socks and like i get a dozen tube socks for six dollars what else do i need to know and it's like well <laughs> i know you're kidding but there's yeah. a lot you need to know and we don't talk about it because that would bring everybody down we got uh, now ran a cover two months ago maybe just before canada day about um the uh the indigenous issues that we're not dealing with quite so much tied to an art gallery and people just were so like inevitably you get letters from people who don't read the magazine but saw the thing and were offended that we would even be talking about this stuff it's like, well you chose to interfere to tell us you don't want to think about something what does that say about you you're yeah. actually angry enough that you're going to complain that you were made to think about a thing that you don't like 
Yeah. That's literally all that happened. Because you've done nothing except write this email. Yeah. And people get that invested. It's so hard to turn the boat around. Like it's, or the, the yacht or the ship or whatever it is. It's a gargantuan effort. And I'm not talking about a government initiative. I'm talking about making people want to care about a government initiative. It's mm-hmm. just, yeah, all you can do is keep chipping away at it, but it's exhausting and it doesn't seem to go anywhere. And then the, the hairy limes of the world, are, they're doing fine until yeah, you call them out on exactly. it. And, even and there are no out. First Nations actors in The Third Man. Yeah, well, there wouldn't have been. <laughs> not even Mickey Rooney pretending to be Ugh, a First Nations person. We don't, we don't but, uh, but yeah, I think all that stuff is in there. And I, 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 I'm sure, I, I feel like there are, you know, there are competing themes going on in the movie but uh, that's what I took took away overall is just the sense of uh, you know what is your what is your commitment to humanity as a person and 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 where does it what are the slippery slopes of looking at the state doing what it does and then you know people like Harry Lyme saying well hey they do that you know and they also brings up the there's also that great quote about uh, was it under the Borgias for 30 years we had terror and murder and bloodshed and you know but we got Michelangelo Leonardo da Vinci in the Renaissance and you know was it Switzerland had 500 years of democracy and what did that create the cuckoo clock right yeah so and that because that uh, is, a, is a funny it, it resonates with me because my friend Kathleen and I were traveling in Mexico I think we were at the temple the temple of the sun or something um, Teotihuacan these uh, old I think the Aztecs used it and the Aztecs don't even know who built it okay. they sort of took it over as ruins and used it um, but we would joke a lot about, you know, like uh, democracy is bad for architecture, because if you think about all of these massive things that people go all over the world to see and are considered great feats of engineering and human creation, most of it was done with slavery or at least, you know, incredibly uh, forceful indentured servitude. Yeah, and they're all monuments to, to leaders, yeah. right? Or I guess the Taj Mahal is a memorial, but... Or even the idea of a culture, you know, that's the other thing is building monuments, I guess, to the idea to what, to the myth you've created for your culture, which again I think is, on, uh, uh, on show with the uh, with the Trump administration, is mm-hmm. that, you know, I have a lot of American friends, and one thing I always say is that, it seems really hard, it seems easier as a Canadian, to get outside that bubble because we don't have the same kind of boastful creation myth that they have. You know, they have right. a really, self. Uh, like it puts a lot of pressure on every uh, every kid who's born in that country I think yeah. because they have this crazy legend of how their country was created and they have to live up to it and if they don't then it's because they're a, you know a subhuman or they yeah. don't have the weak wherewithal or you know, your manifest destiny yeah and the, the idea of that... making America great and I'm always saying like was that during Jim Crow or during slavery like when exactly was it great you yeah. know well, that's the conservative ideal, right? It, it, which weirdly reaches back to this to this period in, in like the post war fifties, where mm-hmm. everything was great. Soldiers got home and had a house and a wife and two kids and a car, and you never had to look at a person of color if you didn't want to. And if they looked at you, you could beat them to death and yeah. you could get away with everything. And the white man's world, right? But that didn't exist. That wasn't real. I and mean, it was in certain pockets of America, but like that's not what New York and Boston like. That's not what the yeah. civilized America was. That was the rural. Uh, horrible like, backwater world of America even if it was built up it was still the south it was still segregated it was only that that only existed in places that didn't allow integration and didn't allow people to interact and mingle you know like racism goes away when you're surrounded by everybody mm-hmm. diversity is the cure at least in theory and your kids grow up with other kids they don't know they're supposed to hate each other and all that and and this weird thing that Reagan introduced, I think, into conservatism, or the Reagan machinery introduced into conservatism, was the idea that, you know, the city on the hill is leave it to beaver. It's it's that level of television, and there were no black people because we didn't allow them to have their own shows, and they, you know, married couples slept in different beds, and nobody ever hit anybody, and nobody was violent, and it's, I mean, there, there must have been people who grew up in that reality. There must have been a few because they could sell it to other people through advertising and it, it struck a chord. But that world never existed. And it's a world where Trump was a dynamic leader and you know, yeah. he's invented this entire personality for himself out of the past as well. Um, where he's never attacked anybody, he's never discriminated against anybody, he's never raped anybody and whatever else. I mean, there are people who certainly claim otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe them. But he got away with it. He sold it. 
and it was through television and media and the fact that he can't put a sentence together doesn't matter and but you know this is a good this is a great uh, wind back to Harry Lyme mm-hmm. and what I think happened in the election in November is that I, I really believe that those people who follow Trump uh, religiously they kind of don't care about that stuff because they really I think you know obviously they have different opinions but I'm, but I think on mass they probably believe that he is because that's the way he would speak about it is that he is the guy who's going to say the emperor has no clothes and he's going to drain the swamp and right. and because what it is is they suspect Hillary Clinton or you know uh, establishment Washington uh, is like the four uh, countries dividing powers, up Vienna yeah. and that they're the hairy limes they're going like you're a, you're a chump if you just vote again and you know and expect something to change from from Washington because it's not going to yeah and I because I believe that too I, that's the one that's the one issue I, I agree with Donald Trump on is that you know the business as usual is not going to is not going to serve Americans uh, which was why I was a Bernie Sanders Sanders uh, supporter if anyone like uh, I just thought wow I've never heard anybody speak like this you know yeah. uh, running for president but uh, yeah but it comes down to that which is that the people just lose faith in the uh, the structure that that claims to be running the whole thing, and uh, and then you have your hairy limes, and then uh, and I, then I guess it depends on how far that goes. Yeah, you know, I come. It's funny because I come from a, a family of gangsters. Like I come from a fam, family of full on gangsters, and my dad had uh, eleven brothers and sisters. Wow. And so there are, there were a lot of hairy limes, and not just the men, the women as well, right? So. Uh, so in my family, there's a resonance. There's some very Lyme-esque resonances <laughs> about, you know, you're a bit of a chump if you pay your taxes regularly. And, you're you know, even at the same time, you can be claiming what a great city Toronto is and how clean it is and how well run it is. And, you, and, you know, part of me goes, well, that costs money and that money comes yeah. from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, so there's that sort of sense uh, in my family. And, and uh, you know, I come from a very working class family and it's that's always under the surface is that there is a certain amount of chumpitude happening if you if you just follow the rules go along because it's set up by people who don't have your interest in mind in the first place and you're just going to feed this machine right and i believe that as well i mean i grew up as a leftist and i I totally agree all about all of that but there's a point where uh i guess there's no other way to say it a less cheesy way to say it than you have a certain responsibility to each other and a certain responsibility to humanity and what you're going to do with your time here yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. I, agree. I agree completely. I mean, the point, I, I don't have kids, but I want my tax money to go to schools uh, because those people are going to need to take care of me. Yeah. I, I understand that I will be dependent on the system at some point, and I want the system to have the best doctors and the best lawyers and advocates, and I know that I can't do it myself. I'm completely aware, uh, more and more every day, frankly, of how incredibly lucky I am just to be doing what I do mm-hmm. and being able to make a living at it. And all of those things mean that, yeah, I will pay my taxes. I'm okay with that. I understand, like, the roads need paving. It's like the people who have trucking companies that think they built them themselves. Where do the roads come from? What do, what right. do you understand? Uh, Trump, who, uh, you know, is a self-made man thanks to a $10 million loan from his father. Yeah. Uh, just, you've got to understand. You've got to, got to see the larger workings. And the thing that fascinates me about Trump compared to Harry Lyme is that Trump isn't consciously exploiting anything, I don't think. I think he's just talking, and mm-hmm. things are happening around him. Like, I don't think he ever expected to be president. I don't think he wants the job now. Yeah. But he's not going to let go of it. It's like Rob Ford becoming mayor. This is mine now. You can't have it. Yeah. I won this. Harry Lyme is fully aware of the limits of his ambition because he doesn't want to work within the government. Like He's defrauding them mm-hmm. because it le- and staying outside is what lets him be successful, even though it's completely vile and illegal and he ultimately does pay for it it's that's what works for him he knows exactly how far he can grift and it isn't until Hollis accidentally uncovers him that it all comes crashing down like he's brought down by love which is so fascinating by mm-hmm. misguided love right. or misplaced trust and it's the one thing he can't account for because he doesn't seem to feel it himself like he's happy to see Hollis but he's yeah. also trying to send him home yeah exactly and you get and he gets uh, over the uh, over the the scope of the film, you get to see uh, Holly Martin's sort of lose his lose his naivety, I guess. Yeah, his when, innocence, his faith, his trust. trust. Until there's nothing left, and then 
everybody's as hollowed out as Harry is. Like that's what that's, I don't understand. Though there's a scene, there's a scene close t- toward the end when they're on the Ferris wheel, talking about delivering a lot of these monologues about mm-hmm. Harry's worldview, and uh, there's a lot of uh, hinting that uh, Holly's been involved with some racketeering with Harry back in the states. Yeah. And I guess maybe unwittingly went to the cops or something, or you know, sold them at once down the, back there. And mm-hmm. so uh, you know, yeah. So maybe I'm not sure. Like an attack of conscience, maybe. Because mm-hmm. he definitely Hollis is invested in not being that guy. Like he wants to be the hero. Yeah. And in a strange way, he. I mean, he is the hero of this movie because that's how movies work. The narrative identifies with him and puts us in his in his shoes. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't do anything especially heroic. He just no. He does blunders. a lot of waffling. Yeah, he just <laughs> blunders and stalls until. And he tries to get laid a couple of times. Yeah, well, which I doesn't mean, work, but for him because she seems to be uh, uh, obsessed with Harry and kind of has already made that pact, I guess, with the devil that you know, or yeah. you know, maybe it is a pact with the devil, or uh, you know, my my uh, grandmother's second husband was Latvian and he wound up in a in a work camp in uh, not Jewish, but he was from Latvian wealth, and I think the Soviets came through and. Oh, so he was expropriated everything they had and put them in Russian camps, and then the Nazis came through. And apparently, when they were they were going, we're being liberated by the Nazis, and they went to Nazi camps. Jesus Christ! Uh, so he, he and he never saw the rest of his family again. But part of uh, that was he would say like once they got out of the camps, once they were eventually uh, liberated from the camps, he said, you know, then you've got two or three years traveling across war ravaged Europe trying to eat. Mm-hmm. You know, trying not to freeze to death and trying to eat, and at that point, you know, I guess it all these all these ideals that we can hold on to when we're warm and fed about what we will and won't do and what humanity is about and what responsibility we have to each other uh, is sorely tested, obviously, in those instances. And then you've got everyone in this. I think they started out by saying, "I never got to visit," you know, the, the Vienna, Vienna of Strauss, yeah. and uh, you know, so then they've got all of those montage scenes of, of uh, the black market and mm-hmm. stuff like that and you know I think sort of suggesting this this is just under the varnish of everything yeah they actually had uh, this is the one trivia point of the third man that surprised me when I was just doing even cursory research the other day um, they had to make it dirtier because three months earlier when they were selling Carol Reed on, on the project Vienna was recovering and and garbage everywhere and like still yeah. destroyed and by the time they got there to shoot it was actually looking too good so they had to <laughs> take it back a bit right which is amazing a lot of the garbage is fake a lot of the rubble is fake they built the vienna of old and then okay. tell us we never got to see it yeah but, but they're of course referring to a previous older vienna it's just a really weird little story but it maybe like when i passed i passed the silver dollar at uh, spadina in college one day and i went wow that's weird. It was it was just completely graffitied. The oh, entire wall was were, graffitied. Yeah, and then I I got to be there days later when they peeled the, I don't know what is mylar or something, mm-hmm. some sticky mylar that they spray paint on, and then, you know, oh. hey presto, they take it off and the wall is clean again. So was it a movie shoot or something? It was or a movie shoot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or a very elaborate uh, theater arts piece. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it was French season. It could have been the uh, yeah the 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 way we fake despair and, and movie misery and all that stuff and this film is steeped in the real stuff mm-hmm. it's just out of frame a little bit because it had to be rebuilt it's it's a fake version of reality that happened just months earlier right. or in this you know in the case of the war years earlier and you're right all of that psychic discontent is right there and I, that's what uh, that's what fascinates me about Alita Valley's performance is that she is basically playing Europe she is mm-hmm. the soul of the of the of the continent and she's fought over by two Americans, neither of whom is really that interested in her. Like Harry <laughs> yeah. just uses her as a as a chess piece more than anything. Yeah. And Hollis wants to sleep with her, but I don't know how hard he's trying. Like I, it's he's convinced himself that he loves her, but I don't think that's ever true. And certainly, she doesn't feel anything for him. Yeah, and there's no there's no uh, evidence on screen, at least, of any interaction that would make you think somebody would fall in love with somebody. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. So if she, Not that Hollywood ever needs that, usually, but... Yeah, but if she represents Europe, the two Americans fighting over her, a perfect... Mm-hmm. They're not even fighting over her. They're just sort of casually uh, batting her back and forth. Yeah, just her. Yeah. That 
kind of stands in for everything that's going on with the with the powers in, in the background that they're playing it out on a human scale like the same way everybody talks about Roger Ebert famously used the third man as the mirror image of Casablanca pre and post war ideology and idealism uh, that Casablanca is America refusing to take refugees that's what that movie is all about it's about an American who has the possibility of saving a refugee and debating for the entire movie am I going to let this guy go to a camp or not mm-hmm. and the third man is well now what do we do we're just we're still strutting around like we have the power to make these decisions for, for millions of destroyed lives and uh, well let's make a few bucks off of it like that's all it ever is Hollis is there for a story yeah. he's going to make a profit on this adventure if he lives and Harry's doing it already. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's so profoundly cynical in 1949 that that level of cynicism was available and flourishing after the war. You know, the everybody talks about the pre-war era as the, the highlight for pulp movies, for film noir, for the Maltese Falcon in 41, before America joined the war. Casablanca was written before America joined the war. All of that stuff is so present yeah, the, the tension and the anger and the German directors were coming over so it was all expressionist and, and you, you create this new genre and then five years of war and then the movies coming out afterwards are somehow broken in a way that other like other post-war Italian cinema maybe mm-hmm. but somehow the Americans saw it first or, or in this case the English they they were making films that were able to convey the I don't even know how to express this without sounding so incredibly pretentious, but they're able to convey the sense of failure in victory that other movies just didn't do. There was this tiny window Mm -hmm. where, yes, we won. It's awful. Everything is terrible. We are still figuring out what victory means. And the cost of winning the war is never dealt with. Not the like the the fact that millions have di- have died on either side on both sides that America has dropped nuclear weapons, which relevant again. Mm-hmm. Um, it's never spoken. It's not important. It's just there all the time. It's in every frame, mm-hmm. and it's such a, a well. And that's what you know. I mean, these movies force you to do something that I I don't know how much energy we expend every day trying not to think about these things, but I think probably most people expend. 85% of their their energy trying to ignore what a random universe we live in and you know and, and how what shenanigans people are up to who we think represent us and yeah. you know because uh, yeah exactly that like just the fact that the spoils are there and that for sure on the ground you know how many millions of Russians die and you know and then the Holocaust and like if you add everything up it's I don't I don't even have a number for how many millions of people die and people, you know, just storming beaches and stuff like that. But at the top of all that game, as you're saying, is Churchill and and uh, Roosevelt and Truman and and just corporations and people moving those chess pieces, who, you know, maybe abstractly care about that, but they don't in any tangible way. Yeah. No, they'll never have to confront the. They don't change cost. their actions because of that mm-hmm. unfortunate fact. Right. Yeah. So it is just people again like this living in the streets and living in the hollowed out bombed out places and hotels that are coping on the on a gra- on the ground level you know and and then all the administrators like uh, you've got uh, Calloway right. the police you know the british the constable army yeah. constable dude and his sidekick who's incredibly uh, endearing you know bernard lee is that bernard future lee? m in the bond films uh, right right yeah, yeah. the first m lovely presence oh, wow. punches a guy and apologizes wow yeah because he's, you can sort of see it physically. He's built like the, mm-hmm. like a bull, but he is very reserved and restrained. And so when he when he punches someone, it's felt. Yeah. But you can also sort of see him as a spy master. Like he's just he's got that presence even there. Yeah, yeah. Like thirteen years away from Doctor No. But, but even those guys appear like they have some lateral movement uh, emotionally, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because they are also pawn pawns you know they're just doing a job that nobody wants to do on the ground yeah and like you said you know like yeah we win hooray you know but some people and and just like it is now like i mean some very small percentage of people are winning massively by that and it is hooray with a capital h for them because they don't you know they'll go there later when it's cleaned up as you said and go holiday there but 
Yeah. But for maybe they'll pass a cemetery, but they won't. Yeah. They won't understand what it means. They won't connect to but it. But for ninety-five percent of the people involved, it's you know, it's a horrible, horrible nightmare. And I, we just went to uh, when we were in Chicago. We went to Skokie. Uh, yeah. Skokie has the biggest, uh, apparently the biggest concentration of uh, Holocaust survivors outside of Israel. And uh, there's the Holocaust Museum there, which is unbelievable to go see. And uh, they had a, they're working on a pro- uh, project there where they have five Holocaust survivors that they're making, they're shooting. Uh, it's not a it's not a hologram per se, but it's like a, it's just shot from so many angles, and it's a sort of a Siri, uh, like uh, aspect where you can ask pretty much any question oh. relevant to their experience, and it will trigger a response from them that's stored somewhere. But we went to do it in the basement. Uh, they're just trying it out, and they had a moderator who was asking questions to the hologram. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then there was a little man in the front row, and there was not very many of us there, so uh, she was saying, well, so ask, you know, ask Aaron a question. So we were, we were talking about, you know, what was it like? He was not in a camp, but he was uh, in the ghetto in Poland, you know, what was like in the ghetto. And as we got along, and it got more and more interesting, we started asking more specific questions, and then it would glitch or something, and then the guy in the front row would go, ask him what happened with the milk and the potato. Right. And then so very quickly we realized, oh, this is Aaron, right? So we got to spend an hour talking oh, face to face with this Holocaust real, survivor. Oh wow. With the real Aaron who they're making this, you know, he's very strange he was going, "Well, ask him," you know. So like, he's consulting with his own image. He's consulting with his own image uh and uh just some of the stories he told, you know, I mean, obviously there's just a billion stories uh that are also reminiscent to things that happened in the third man, which is just how you get by day to day or like as I said my my grandmother's second husband like uh how you get how you make it you know once once you're over the you know and this is once you're once you're past the nightmare itself yeah. you know the light at the end of the tunnel you come out the tunnel and it's like oh now i have to not starve to death yeah and We're, just and me and tens of hundreds of thousands of other people you know it's not just me yeah we're seeing it again now i mean this the latest wave of documentaries at hot dogs this year there was so much stuff about the refugee experience the simple concept that people coming out of aleppo people coming out of well all of syria are just, you know, like, they had jobs. They're not this faceless mass. They were doctors and lawyers and accountants and baristas mm-hmm. and um, and buskers and people just now walking for hundreds of miles, potentially, just to be somewhere else. And there's a there's one movie called... Not to be glib, but I don't think we can take in any more baristas. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I think we've hit critical mass on the baristas. Hit 24-hour Starbucks eventually. They're going to need jobs. They're going to need people in there. Um yeah. No, like you're, you're, yeah, well, specialized workers. Um, There'll be a cab. He used to be, I'm driving a cab now, but I used to be a barista. Where yeah, I come from. that's true. The cab, the Uber and the Uber economy. When Lyft comes to Canada, they can add those jobs. Uh, but there's a documentary called 69 Minutes of 86 Days, which is simply a camera following a family, a refugee family, mostly focusing on this four year old girl. As they make their way, they've already arrived in Europe, and they're basically just going through Europe to get to France, I believe. Mm -hmm. And everyone in this family is just, all they do is line up and wait and go to the next place and line up and wait and go to the next place. And they eat stuff when people give them stuff. They have a, they don't have anything. They have a small bag of food here and there yogurt and fruit and whatever's available. And, And you see the refugee workers and you see the relief people and you see everybody operating on it and they are every one of the people in this family is trying to let the four-year-old have a normal experience right. it's just like a big road trip for her they're doing everything they can and that is more powerful to tell the story to explain the story of how these are just people they're not secret terrorists they're not mm-hmm. you know some kind of islamic wave that's conspiring you just you listen to them talking to the kid and telling stories and how it's just going to be like, we're going to get there. We're going to get there eventually. And they do, they get there. But we have this compressed experience of it in 70 minutes where you're just, even in 70 minutes, you're made aware of just how boring it is, how ordinary and how normal yeah. it is and how restless you get. It's like, it's nothing. It's nothing. I, I, all I can think of is that everybody, myself and everybody I know, we would fold. We would do whatever it took instantly, immediately. There'd be no debate. As soon as my cell phone dies, mm-hmm. uh, you know, full Mad Max, we'll all be. And I have no skills. I'm the Patton Oswalt in this situation. I'm, right. You know, like I'm sad boy. Uh, but to 
to imagine it in a time before the technological advances we have, where you really are alone, where you can't contact anybody, where you can't get in touch with people, where you can't make social media appeals, uh, or, or just tell your family you're okay. The idea that people wouldn't know about their, their relatives for years, and that, that Harry Lyme is actively making it worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and that America actively made it worse for so many other people. Again, that you know, not by deliberate action, just by one, you know, like let's help this one town instead of this one. Right. Just that that swath of indifference that runs through all of this stuff. Because once you, yeah, as you once you get high enough, it's all abstract. It's all just numbers. Well, that's the banality of evil thing, right? Like, yeah. You look at Harry Lyme in that uh, he's in that first wheel. He's just know. such a cherub, you know, like, and he's got that glint in his eye and it's sort of like you want to like him yeah even when you know what he's doing you kind of still want to like him but it's almost like you're saying about with the refugees experience on the ground is almost there needs to be a book written called the banality of suffering as well mm. which is sort of you know because our sense is to put this noble aspect on it you know a nobility on, on yeah. the suffering and really probably for the people experiencing and it's like as you said you know what it's really fucking boring yeah and it's really you know it's painful and it's horrible but it's also really boring which is the one thing, you know, I almost think that North Americans could probably suffer pain and suffering more than boredom, you know? Yeah. Because we're so wired to just be constantly entertained and titillated. Yeah. yeah. If you so, know. it's a, well, you know, another thing at the, at the Holocaust Museum in Skokie was, was, uh, uh, was it, I guess it was Roosevelt's reaction to Kristallnacht, and he said uh, that he, it, it took him uh, by surprise, sort of somewhere deep in his heart, that he couldn't believe that civilization, that a that like a democratically elected c- civilization, right. could fall to this level. And then beside it, they have some they had uh, some statistics on something like eighty two percent of Americans were horrified by the acts of uh, of the Nazis and the regime there. Six uh, percent of people were willing to take refugees in. Yeah. So yeah. just a real disconnect. And again, it, it sort of strikes it strikes home as to how contemporary that is as well. Like how yeah. few people will, are willing to take, are willing to really, I mean, it's not, it's not 6% obviously, but I mean like with the Syrian refugee situation. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody was complaining to me the other day, just the other day, someone said, well, you know, do you think we should be like, think about all the people that are housing in this Olympic stadium in, in Montreal. Is that, is that right? And I was like, why are you asking this question? They're, they're there to be vetted for, for refugee status, yes, of course it's right. We should put them somewhere. You, you just turn them back. Someone else, oh, it was in response to somebody who said, well, you know, they're already in the United States. They're not refugees anymore. We just don't want them. It's like, what the fuck are you even saying? Mm-hmm. What does that even, like, if you listen to this argument, it's, yeah, okay, you can make the argument that maybe America shouldn't be taking in refugees. You can make that argument. I don't agree with it. But if that's your deal as a columnist, fine. But if you start trying to just fudge reality to support this already vile point that you can't support with facts, right? Why am I? What just? What doesn't? And you should run for office. Yeah, well, you probably already are. You might be a, a, <laughs> a senator. It's just, it's just horrible to see how yeah how quickly we get there, and. That's Hollis Martin. That's Harry Lyme. That's where they are. And we didn't see it coming. We never see it coming. We never learn yeah. as a species. That's the worst thing. People now are as bad as they were before. We just, we were either better at hiding it on social media or we're worse at hiding it, depending on who you are. Yeah. And yeah, I come back to this movie and it makes me feel better in a weird way because, yeah, we haven't gotten any better, but at least I'm not the worst. Right, the generations before us were also terrible people. And well, and time doesn't sit, stand still. I mean, like the the one positive aspect that comes out of the cynicism that's in this movie is to at least once and for all look at it with open eyes and, mm-hmm. and realize it's happening. I mean, if you can't fix something that you don't know is happening, right? So, again, you know, in in a way, Trump being elected uh, made me think. Well, maybe one good thing that can come out of this is people will see what it is, like. Yeah. You know, four years of the reality on the ground may may help mm, steer some people in the right direction yeah. because, you know, I I think it can't it can't hold. You know, yeah. It's just like again coming back to Vienna. Vienna can't hold with you know four people d- dividing it up and having different sections where different uh, black marketeers can hide out in. Yeah. That that can't hold. You know, there has to be something, something has to be reconciled. You know, mm. so that average people can get on with their lives and 
yeah, with but, some form of dignity. But even if Harry Lyme is outed and destroyed in the end, someone else will just step in. There'll be another one. Like, oh, that's for sure. The crushing reality that ends the film is, as she just walks on. You're like, yeah, you blew it. You blew it, and Europe is lost. Yeah. And look where we ended up. Although, you know, now you can get a cuckoo clock anywhere. You can go get one at Walmart. I don't know that. I don't know what that means. Who won? Well, and you can put your coffee mug on a Da Vinci coaster. That's true. Yeah, it's all commercial. <laughs> it's all blurring together. They never. Yeah, nobody. That's the thing that amazes me when I watch an older film about war and, and profiteering. They never saw the military-industrial complex thing tipping over all the way into Walmart, into mm-hmm. you know, two corporations. You you get it in stuff like RoboCop. It had to be science fiction. It has to be imagined as this impossible dystopia where everything ends in the corporate interest. It's like, no, we're living in that. Yeah. It's just, you couldn't conceive of it in the 80s because everybody thought, oh, we'll smarten up. Like, everybody always thinks we'll smarten up, and we never do. Yeah, we're like in the 13th where you get the, to, to uh, privatize prisons. prisons you yeah. Know, and you're yeah. just like, and the amount of major corporations that support it through whatever that shadow organization yeah. is that manipulates or you know or suggests things to send yeah, yeah. yeah. well I mean they just like Blackwater wants to privatize a chunk of military operations right now and people are saying this sounds like a fine idea like they've never seen a movie where the bad guys turn out to be mercenaries every time <laughs> every time even Robocop it's in Robocop All right. and people just like you gotta you gotta use metaphors you gotta like you gotta have a zither score that leads people to the idea <laughs> brings them along gracefully it's just, oh, it's such a good movie, and it just saw everything coming, because it was happening already. It was right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I guess what Graham Graham Greene novel turned into a Graham Greene uh, screenplay. Yep, and now that helps. Well, and he, I mean, he was a spy. He was actually witnessing this stuff. He was aware of it during the war. Yeah. Uh, Carol Reed worked with the British um, filmmakers unit. But Green was apparently just doing stuff. He was running as around. As well as uh, he Ian was Fleming, Ian Fleming. Right? Yeah. yeah, Ian Fleming. I'm just reading a book called uh, The Crook Factory about Hemingway. Oh, I don't know this. Uh, the funny thing is, in the back, you know, acknowledge and everything the writer says, uh, basically 95 percent or 90 percent of the factual stuff is real, has mm-hmm. been declassified, and Hemingway was running around Cuba uh, with a ragtag team of bartenders and pool boys. And CIA agents that were stuck in—I don't know if it was the CIA yet, but uh, yeah, OSS maybe hunting yeah. OSS, yeah, hunting uh, Nazi U-boats in the water out of the Pilar, which I've seen the Pilar when I went to Cuba, mm-hmm. uh, a little tiny boat, and apparently they he he got uh, Hoover and uh, or whoever was in whoever was the step down that was dealing with Hemingway uh, gave them grenades and uh, Thompson machine guns and stuff so that if they got close to a conning tower and something happened, they could throw grenades down into the into the Jesus. U-boat and uh, so apparently all of that is legit and real and uh, and then it just becomes not unlike uh, the third man it just becomes this quagmire of uh, you know Abwehr agents from from Nazi Germany Nazi agents uh, MI5 OSS like and some people are double agents some people are triple agents right. some people don't even know anymore who they're working for they're mm-hmm. just working and uh, yeah, and you just go like, this is the kind of thing you couldn't write it. You couldn't write it as fiction because people would go, that's nobody would do that, you know. And right. Yeah. It couldn't get that bad, you know. But this is all just declassified information. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that as soon as humanity gets involved in something, it gets worse. Like I think that's the other lesson of the third man. It's once you introduce personal feelings into this situation where everything's supposed to be above board and yeah. legitimate, it just you know feelings are what get Harry Lyme killed. Feelings are what ruin everything. Uh, and then you, were, you kept mentioning the doubling down too, and I think that's yeah. a really uh, astute observation about humans in general. Is that if you don't double down, then you've used every ounce of your humanity to not double down. Because I think people are wired to double down, if, yeah, you know, double rather down. than admit. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to be wrong. Nobody wants to be wrong, and they'll just keep doubling down until, like this Crook Factory book, where until it's not recognizable anymore, and you don't even know. You may not even know what you originally stood for because yeah, you're just acting in your interest or what you perceive your interest to be. Harry Lyme is only ever out for himself. Yeah, like he's got clarity in a way that nobody else does. All the best villains do, right? Because you're supposed to be able to. The key to a good villain is that you want them to maybe win. Like they're, they're yeah. they make a good enough case that you can justify. Well, he's not. I mean, he's not murdering children in front of me, and he has a really nice suit, and he's pretty charismatic. Like well, casting Orson Welles is the 
absolute masterstroke of this yeah. film. Like, you can picture it with other people, but Wells is having a ball being evil. He is having... Tom the... Selleck was going to originally play that role. And I can sort of <laughs> like a, a young four-year-old Tom Selleck. Yeah. Uh, but like you think about who else might have been able to do it, like, you know, Coleman maybe, or like, or Cary Grant could have probably done it. Like, mm-hmm. he would be somebody you would just, you would want to root for. Or Jimmy Stewart would have been brilliant, but too much of a straight arrow. Like, yeah. He, he played great villains when he did it, like, and, and Vertigo is amazing at using his own persona against him. But Wells... That voice, that carriage, that that persona, everything he'd been doing leads back to this somehow. And it's, it's, and it's also a perfect mirror image of Cain, too, right? Because it's an investigation of someone who isn't there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the more we learn about him, the less we like him. But, oh boy. Yeah, this is... He, and how old, how, old is, how, old, how old is Wells in The Third Man? He was in Just, his late 30s, maybe? Because he was 27 when he made Cain, I think. Unless I'm off by a couple of years. But he wouldn't have been 40. He was a baby. Yeah. And in a way, I can't imagine... You know, he does what... You know, if, when you, I was talking to somebody about the Beatles the other day about just how many records they made and that none of them were 30 by the time the band broke up. And you can't... You can't almost, your brain them. almost yeah. can't... They've always been old masters. Yeah, your, your brain almost can't even calculate that that's possible and the same with Wells like you know the mm-hmm. things he's doing at what was he was the Mercury Theater stuff when he was 25 and everything yeah, like, yeah where the world is in 38 is there a 25 year old now doing <laughs> things like that or? there probably is but we don't like Xavier Dillon wants to be that guy but he's not like, yeah. he's just he, he's doing other things um, I don't know I don't think that we allow for that kind of mer- like explosive success anymore that emergence mm-hmm. I think we have celebrities now but we don't have a lot of geniuses genius takes forever Bjork, maybe, right? What she's doing and how she's doing it and her work with other artists. It also could be that, you know, I'm, I'm willing to accept that maybe genius as we know it suggests a certain monoculture that doesn't exist anymore, too. Well, that's right? true. We're so fragmented that you probably couldn't take over the world with one thing. Yeah, because when the Beatles were around or when Wells was around, the entire continent was directed at them, you know? Mm. Like, these are the people you should be looking to. Yeah. You know, whereas now... You can listen to, you know, your favorite people singing in Urdu. You don't have to listen to, you know. That's true. You have the whole range of... A pop star from... From one place. From England, although we still do. Oh, sure we do. Yeah, Adele, I guess. She's got, like, no enemies. That's, and yeah. that's what genius is at this point, where everyone agrees on how great someone is, and we can stop there. So it's Beyonce and Rihanna and Adele, and they're all singing songs about feelings which is great because we need but Adele those. also has that that uh, Coronation Street card which is that you know that when the singing stops she's really foul mouthed and she can drink everybody under the table yeah. it's like that is an unbeatable combination all the best English artists swear like sailors Emily Blunt oh, she's so great and she's playing Mary Poppins now it's obscene it's so <laughs> great um, yeah no it's it's a weird place to be and, and Wells who was like never the movie star he wanted to be, I don't think, on his terms anyway. As a yeah. filmmaker, he always felt he was a failure. He should have, and his movies took forever to get released and made, and were just like, the other side of the wind is finally coming out now, thanks to Netflix 40 odd years later. Um, Wells, as a presence, though, unequaled. He mm-hmm. was the shadow. He was, you know, like, every, he, he was, yeah, the monoculture. He dominated the concept of stardom. And then having him turn up in this and just, by the way, he's evil. I mean, he played The Stranger a couple of years earlier, which every, or he'd starred in The Stranger. He made The Stranger, the film where he's a Nazi in hiding. And so this felt like a natural evolution probably at the time to him, but it's it eclipses every other performance. Even Kane, I think. I think this is his... The, yeah. Stepping out of the shadows is his defining moment for all time. And he didn't even direct it. It must have yeah. killed him. It must have I'm sure it killed him. Well, I was going to ask you, too, if you know, like, is there, a, is there a corollary till now about the Graham Greene writing and then writing the screenplay? I, don't, I mean, I don't pay enough attention to who's writing the screenplays these days, but, like, is there an analogy now to, like, a, yeah. a classic, Some, a giant of literature stepping up and writing the screenplay for the film maybe, as well? Maybe not giant. So I'm trying to think. I think Ian McEwan has adapted a couple of his own books. That's probably as close as we get. Uh, Diddy and did it in the 60s I think or did she just write other stuff she might have worked on other people's scripts uh, there aren't a lot at least in the English language 
think there's a French uh, Michel Hollebeck has made a couple of movies mm -hmm. okay. uh, in France but I think unless I'm forgetting somebody really obvious in which case people are screaming it out of their headsets uh, I can't think of anybody who's doing quite as much but I'm going to guess the Hollebeck film is, sh is showing at you know the oh they're not yeah no they're not uh, like I don't yeah. yeah I don't think there's anybody working in the mainstream that's doing this sort of thing I mean are there even novelists that work in the mainstream anymore Mailer was probably are the there last novelists one. anymore <laughs> oh sure what's happening but you know I'm thinking about Margaret Atwood working very closely with people right. on on the Handmaid's Tale and Alias Grace but she's not writing the scripts mm -hmm. that's those are that's other people doing the translation um, yeah I don't know John Irving wrote the Cider House Rules won an Oscar for it for the screenplay that was a while ago that was a while yeah he hasn't done much since <laughs> uh, not in the film world anyway I don't know I don't think there I don't think there is a, a corollary I think that was the time where you could yeah where it was possible and you Green probably room. would sense more than me what you know where the left turns are happening in terms of what film is becoming as mm -hmm. opposed to what it might have been and maybe yeah. that's just like you know somebody saying well there's no good music anymore like maybe it's just a, a non-issue that is just in you know the valleys and peaks maybe there's maybe we're in a period of time where you can only make mainstream superhero movies or be in in a it certainly feels that way an alternative I mean, universe you know yeah uh, by the time this comes out it won't be embargoed I think I can talk about it I just saw Martin McDonough's new film this morning uh, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri and that's the work of an artist like mm -hmm. that feels like a singular voice is speaking and using film in a way that maybe it couldn't have this story couldn't have been told any other way. I mean, he's a, he started as a playwright, but his movies are really cinematic. In Bruges, maybe not so much. That one yeah. uses a lot of small spaces and rooms, but Set in Psychopaths is this great, big, broad thing, and, and this film is inherently cinematic uh, in the way that it tells its story and the way that it uses close-ups and silence to linger on people and make you think about morality and, and what the right decision is and realizing that even a good person can do awful things simply by not doing something rather right. than acting and how a good person can do something hurtful for the best of reasons and a bad person can do something good for the best of reasons and still you know you're you're left to sort of steep in ambiguity and learn about compassion and two hours of that felt like a a, an ice bath it was great you come out of it and you just think about well what would I do and that sounds like the dumbest way to sell a movie but mm -hmm. I think that's the only question that matters anymore now yeah. right now like what would you do uh, I wrote about Don McKellar's last night for CBC because I was on the filmmakers a couple of weeks ago and they asked for an essay about it about the film and I realized while I was writing it that the whole point of all of Don's work is how would you react in this situation it's just about placing people in weird awkward moments and seeing how, what happens it's his thing he loves it right um, and the message of last night which takes place in the last six hours of humanity is Just sleep with your French teacher well that's one of them but it's what would you do there isn't that much time yeah and that is also sort of the question in three billboards but it's also the question the only question that really matters anymore I'm now that I thought about it I'm seeing it everywhere because it is like it's the essence of conflict, right? If you care about the characters, you want to know what they do because there are avatars in some way. That's why we're experiencing the story. We want to know how it ends. We want to know what happens. And the third man going in, we know how it ends. Mm -hmm. You can kind of feel it and watching it repeatedly. Like this isn't a movie that's black and white. It's not going to have a happy ending. They didn't do that. That's not how that worked. Yeah. And it's just incredible to see you know, those questions happening and forming in the movie and we know what Harry Lyme would do. The question is what Holly will do. And, yeah. You know, will he protect his friend or will he and believe will he protect his friend and believe the lie or will he reject everything he knows for the truth, which he also knows but has been avoiding mm -hmm. for a hundred minutes. And he has a moment where he uh, even laid into it, he has a moment where he waffles, right? Mm -hmm. He's not going to do it. Yeah. And then there's the scene of them taking him through the hospital yeah it isn't until he's confronted head on that with the with the impact confronted of by a, a face down teddy bear yeah. <laughs> which is such a great image and yeah it's so like it's almost dumb like it's almost too much but it's beautiful but it's, it works it's like yeah. it's so economic i was going to say the same thing about the you know the book ended uh driving past her walking down the long road yeah um could very easily have been obvious and sort of cheesy but uh I think it works so incredibly well and it just you know obviously it just underlines the point that no matter what 
these few actors do, this exact scenario is going to continue to recycle itself. Mm -hmm. And even just that they let it go till she walks right past camera and they still have him there for a while. You know, because part of me, part of you is expecting that she's going to stop and there's going to be some engagement. Right. And she just walks right by and yeah. And then I've, he smokes and <laughs> yeah, we fade to black. I love that. I love the linger at the end of a movie just when it's supposed to be over and it goes on for another couple of beats just because it reminds you that you wanted a different ending mm -hmm. in these things. In this movie and a, a number of other ones, Soderbergh does it all the time, just hangs a little too long and just makes you think that, oh, no, no, that's over. Yeah. Or like it's, The Wolf of Wall Street where six times I went, okay, let's go yeah. get dinner. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, hey, what are we going mean, to... Oh, okay. I'm pretty much done half an hour in after that conversation with McConaughey. That's the movie. Like, yeah. I've seen the movie, and the rest of it is just excess, which is sort of the point. I know. Um, it's Quite just, was inspired, but... Yeah, it was. It was fun. It was like a mummer's <laughs> play. I've never seen anything like that on film. Um, but yeah, well, this this logically brings us to the, the end of the movie, brings us to the, the, the end of the podcast, and the final question is always the same, which is what, if anything, of the third man have you borrowed or stolen or, or referenced or incorporated into your own creative DNA? Have you ever used a zither in anything? I'm just starting with the music. Uh, I've started watering down my friend's uh, medicine. Okay, well just tell them. <laughs> and then selling them. the rest of it on the black market. Uh, I've never used a zither. I don't think I've ever heard the zither used in another soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I think someone once quoted it in a parody sense somewhere. Like it yeah. shows up in an airplane movie somewhere. But that's the only other time I'm aware of it. And of course this is just a North American phobic or North American file answer because I'm sure there are soundtracks in certain places where it's nothing but zither all the sure, time. But sure. um, yeah, what I mean, what do I take away? I mean, I, I went in, you know, I was going to mention something about what would you do in a certain case. And one of the things that makes me want to watch The Third Man over and over again is because I'm predisposed to that. As I was saying, growing up, I grew up as a Marxist. So I was like, had all these, you know, with one major situation in history was the Spanish War which really stuck out to me as a noble maybe the final noble time to go and fight for something you believed in mm -hmm. given that of course World War II had to be fought but you know what we what we look at now in black and white as a as a fight against fascism was right. a lot of other things as well uh, and then recently I was reading in Rolling Stone about uh, these North American anarchists and communists going to Raqqa to fight ISIS, mm -hmm. and it was the f only other time in my adult life that I thought, you know, if I was in a different scenario, if I didn't have an 11-year-old daughter that needs me, uh, and I was 22 years old, I think I'm not even being disingenuous to say that I would consider going, because one thing that's jumped right out at me was that you have to fight your way over there, not unlike Spain. You get there, they said when you land, the cab driver, if they pick you up and you're white, they go, they take you straight to the safe house, because they know <laughs> that's where you're going. And what really stuck uh, stuck in my brain was that when you get there, you spend two months uh, studying feminism, okay. because the anarchists and leftists that are fighting there say these are the people who are hit hardest by ISIS, regardless of what uh, propaganda wants to tell you. You know, these sure. are the people suffering hardest from it, so these are the people we're fighting for, and just something like that. You know, what would you do in that case? You know, and it's I think it's sad and it's and it's horrifying that in a 53 year old man's life, there's only two times I can think that. I could imagine going somewhere that doesn't have a stain on it, you know? Yeah, a to good go cause. Fight for the the good fight, you know? Yeah. I assuage my conscience by donating to Doctors Without Borders. It feels mm -hmm. like the safest... Safe is the wrong word, but it feels like the best possible way to help. Where can you put your energies, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, I'd rather be with the people who are treating the wounded and helping hold ground. And, you know, it's going to be a milkshake duck situation. Eventually, we're going to find out that Doctors Without Borders has been funneling money somewhere too because somebody in the organization like there's always somebody in the organization it's just you, yeah. you have to do what you think is best but that's moral relativism that's the, the heart well, of all your of partner it. might say so are we going to go and help Doctors Without Borders I'm like Sunday and they're like what time on Sunday yeah it's right. breaking bad's on <laughs> there's always something else yeah oh I know. I was. You know, the other thing too is I think that you know we're all hairy limes in our little ways on a daily basis mm. and on every level we, we decide where we're comfortable with that you know clearly not to the level that Harry Lyme is but comfortable with himself but uh, yeah. he was just really good at it he was very good at it and he managed to just be such a charming cherub through the whole thing oh, yeah. maybe if I had dimples like that I would it would let me get away with a lot more things I wonder like if you truly don't think you're doing anything wrong I mean if these people are going to die anyway like when does that kick in 
Mm -hmm. Is he just better at seeing the opportunity than most other people? I mean, I think obviously that's the point. He he was because he was successful at it. But oh, that little voice. Like the the thing about Trump now. Um, there were in the first in the first weeks of uh, the fall last year before the election, somebody leaked the story about him asking his security advisors why we can't use nuclear weapons in situations, why the U.S. won't do it. And the idea that that had to be explained to him and that now he's president and mm -hmm. now you just know, like, he wants to push that button. Why not? The, the story of um, somebody's theory, uh, a political psychologist or a political scientist uh, said that the, the way to best protect the codes is to put them in a capsule and implant them in a human being that the president himself must kill to get there. <laughs> right. To, to make him, and this was the quote, to put blood on the floor. If there's going to be a nuclear strike, you have to confront death. Right. And everybody is horrified by that story. And it's like, Trump would, he couldn't wait to do it. He would love to kill a guy. Like, to have a reason to kill a guy? It's win-win. It's like the one thing he hasn't done, I hope. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ, we're dead. Oh, Yeah, it's always going to be humans. It's always going to be petty human shit. Mm -hmm. So we can at least, you know, enjoy it, high cinema of it, and yeah. feel better about ourselves. Oh, God. How does the third man make me depressed? How have we got here? Certainly not all those beautiful expressionist uh, sewer shots. No. And it's, it's a beautiful. sewer! Everything is... Oh, it's the best looking sewer I've ever seen. It is, it is. It's a great sewer. But it doesn't quite get away from the metaphor, right? Like, they're still running through shit to get it to... Uh, the, the chance of saving themselves. Oh, boy. <laughs> My thanks to Ron Hawkins, who will be taking the stage with the lowest of the low this Saturday, September 9th, at the Danforth Music Hall, launching their new album, Do the Right Now. That album is available everywhere on Friday, September 8th, on vinyl, CD, and digital, and you should pick it up. Thanks also to Lawrence Nichols. He knows what he did. Ron's not on Twitter, but you can find him at ronhawkins.com, which is also where you can buy tickets to the Danforth show. And if you're not in Toronto, check out the complete tour schedule at lowestofthelow.com. You can find The Third Man on Blu-ray and DVD in the U.S. and Canada as part of Lionsgate's Studio Canal Collection. Sadly, the Criterion Collection's exquisite special edition is long out of print. Oh, there's also a newer U.K. release, mastered from the recent 4K restoration, which is apparently playable in all regions, so, you know, maybe check out amazon.co.uk or get a friend in London to mail it to you. It's not expensive. And of course, you can find the film on iTunes and Google Play. I think they're using a new restoration these days as well. Oh, and I checked. Orson Welles was 33 when he shot this movie. Jesus Christ. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. Come back on Friday for the first of our special TIFF episodes, because there's some good stuff coming. And if you want to leave a review on iTunes, that would be greatly appreciated. Just remember, leave death to the professionals. Thanks for listening. <laughs>